I think you're right. <laughs> yeah. I thought it was sounding like Farouk there for a minute. <laughs> I thought, hey. I got some uh, Grio Galaxy here. Well, hi, everybody. How you doing? Uh, thanks for joining us tonight. We've got a pretty interesting program, uh, I believe. And uh, <laughs> I know, didn't it? <laughs> um, You know, this is like, um, I'm not sure exactly what's going on here, but I have to, oh, there I am. All right, we need to kill this part of it. Okay, so welcome everyone to uh, Poets and Pies and Jazz tonight. We've got some cool uh, uh, performances and um, poetry. We're going to hear from um, it, pretty much in this order, just I, I wanna play a poem, uh, Al Young reading a jazz poem. Uh, Al passed away about a week ago and uh, he was a great friend uh, to me and to many of us in Detroit. Um, and then I, I'm gonna have uh, Bill Harris read some poetry and I'll play uh, some of Marion Hayden and um, Melba Joyce Boyd reading poetry. And then we'll, uh, we'll have Gary uh, Carner talk about, he's the Pepper Adams archivist and biographer. We'll have him talk about uh, his experiences with Pepper Adams and we'll play a little bit of Pepper's music. So that's the program. Uh, I want to thank the Detroit Public Library, the main branch, uh, uh, Genevieve Caruso for helping us to and allowing us to do this through them. Welcome to all the people from the library who are tuned in. Um, we're on Facebook Live if anybody needs to or wants to tell someone to check this program, check this program out. I'll be letting uh, folks in here um, as we go along. But I'm going to first I'm going to play uh, for you. Uh, I guess I should have said I uh, I'm ML Liebler. I'm the director of the Detroit Writers Guild and uh, host of these kinds of programs here. Uh, we will have some interesting living room series uh, programs um, coming in. Uh, in May, Peter Cooley is going to do a reading. He's from Detroit originally, hasn't uh, been here in a while, and we're going to get him and his daughter and some other folks on here. Uh, but let me play Al Young reading a poem, and then we can um, 
we can go forward from there. So this this will be Al Young reading. Depression, blues, flamenco, wine, despair. Sunk in, they make you cross your heart and die for hope. Dark times come at you, they don't care. So deal with this, they say. And so you buy the pain and stress, the restlessness, the works. Low back pain, aches and limps, the twitch of fear your face betrays. John Dizzy Burks Gillespie's cheeks puffed out, fat love and itch scratched by the trumpet at his goateed lip. They said, take chances, stretch, jump at the sun. You just can't spend your whole life acting hip. Be corny sometimes. Have yourself some fun. You can't be cool forever, so relax. Diz knew puffed cheeks were anything but chic, but when you closed your eyes, you heard him axe infinitives, split atoms, hairs. You speak that tongue, curves, flatlands, all of it. You do. You understand the hoodoo stab of hurt, the blues, their messy messages, a few trashed hopes, some lame goodbyes, her skirt, your coat, the folded jeans, wet tight, wet tights, Black night is falling all around you in the rain. Dark times, dark times can fix you in the light of reason, recognition, lasers, pain. And I think, how are we doing for time? It's about, we're about there, aren't we? It's the way, it's the way I feel. Uh, this is the poem that you'll find out there on Addison Street. So that's uh, Al Young. Uh, reading a poem Al passed away about a week ago and I, I just wanted to uh, to hear his voice and see him again uh, in action. So next up is going to uh, the first poet we're going to hear from will be Bill Harris and um, just looking for a couple of uh, points here. Uh, I wanted to talk about uh, Bill Bill is a well-known playwright, uh, poet, Detroit poet, um, jazz aficionado, uh, and he has a number of books, uh, most recently a book of short stories from the Wayne State University Press, uh, but also he did a book uh, a, a few years ago for Naomi Long Magic, who we just commemorated uh, last Friday, I believe it was, uh, through the Virgil Carr Center. And um, the Yardbird Suite, and I asked him not just to read that, but if he if he'd favor us with uh, with some of his jazz uh, poems. So, uh, could I please bring on and turn the camera on, Bill Harris? Hello, hello. Yeah, hey, you got to put your put your camera on. Uh, Right. Um, out there. There we go. Mm. Uh, thank you, Elmel, for asking me to uh, to be a part of this. Um, when I was thinking about what I was going to read uh, this morning, uh, the go away, dummy. <laughs> 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 Go away. Yeah. <laughs> That's, it's been 55 years of that. Yeah, um, well, I hear you. I'm getting close uh, to 50, so. <laughs> yeah, congratulations. Um, first thing I thought of was, you know, Pepper Adams and uh, just the whole bebop spirit of Detroit. And uh, you mentioned Al and you mentioned uh, Naomi. And for me, they were both, I mean, Al was, you know, spent a, uh, his kind of formative years in Detroit. And um, the poem that he just read, there was a line that you can't be cool forever. And uh, I think Al was um, the entire time that I knew him. And uh, I, he was one of the, and I've known some cool people in my life. Uh, 
you know, noted so and otherwise, and they all was probably uh, in, the, in the top five or if not the top three, as was Naomi. And uh, I kind of see both of them as a part of the bebop spirit. Now it's, it, it's a little stretch uh, perhaps with Naomi, but she had the kind of elegance. Um, you did? I think um, a person like Milt Jackson, and I'm gonna read a poem about Milt Jackson, who became a part of the uh, MJQ, which was, for my money, the coolest quartet, uh, coolest and bluesiest that has ever lived. So um, I wanted to kind of start off not with a poem, but with some writing by um, Al Young. And it's from his book, uh, Bodies and Soul, a musical memory, memoirs. And it's uh, a and an article entitled Remembering Pepper Adams and Donald Byrd, The World Stage Detroit, circa 1955. And I'm going to just read a couple of uh, excerpts from this as a lead in. In those days, Al says, a distant version of now, a lot of beautiful music went unrecorded. It sailed out of windows and doorways, escaping into trees. Much of it got blown up into slow poke clouds where liquefied it fell back to earth sometimes thunderously in the form of cleansing rain or a slow delicious snow two of the most popular horn men apparently appearing regularly at the world stage were donald bird and pepper adams as was the case with each with other locally based favorites these shining young instrumentalists were loved and revered for the music they made now to understand what that meant for the, uh, for the 1950s, and then the jump, uh, the key word was fun. Pepper Adams, for example, was fun to listen to and watch. So was Donald Byrd, though for totally different reasons. To begin with, Pepper had a way of turning heads at those predominantly black gatherings. A quiet man, mild of manner, and as self-effacing as if he were as he was lanky. He wore his hair in a youthful crew cut style of the Eisenhower era. Retiring in his Ivy League togs and horn rim glasses, complete with Clark's desert boot loafers, you could easily have pegged him as president of the Wayne State University Young Republicans, which he wasn't, or as a daytime insurance office worker, which in fact he was for a spell. But once he got that baritone saxophone mouthpiece to his lips, there was no mistaking him for anything other than a confirmed creative musician who took his calling seriously. What you remembered afterward was the warmth and passion he breathed into his solos. You came away with the feeling that he loved his chosen music enough to have taken pains to absorb the depth of its history. And as a kind of follow-up to that, I have a poem um, by Milt Jackson, another Detroit musician who I mentioned uh, had this kind of elegance with a kind of really deep bluesy bass. And this is um, a poem that's written after a photograph it was a noted jazz um, photographer, Milt Jackson, New York, 1956. Great Gabriel blows and bags waits. Bags was his nickname. Looking for all the world like some pinstriped pastor, some messenger reverend in his glowing white shirt. Waits, steel straight, hands clasped, chin up, head cocked as if to catch sight through the membrane of this swarth of the memory flame of men back home named boy with earth urns in the creases of their calloused hands. The memory of rough plank churches, jukes and barbershops, the taste of well water and lightning and the bile from swallowed gorge and bitten tongues, droughts and floods and moonlight and northbound trains and rented rooms and blind pigs and storefronts. Bags waits to bring that light to his blues. Um, a noted, another noted musician, Detroit musician who was um, around at the time that um, 
Pepper was here uh, was Roy Brooks, uh, another real character, another uh, who I think could have only come from Detroit. And uh, his, he was a drummer, a percussionist, and his um, work, I think, was, was based in a very Detroit kind of rhythm. Um, and this is uh, written uh, about a performance by Roy. It's a longer article, but uh, I'll just read an excerpt from it. The Aboriginal Orchestra is Brooks's percussion choir, a huge and exciting ensemble with representation from the entire percussion family and then some. In concert at the Hart Plaza in Detroit, the orchestra of more than 20 musicians and a tap dancer uses a 4-4 backbeat to charge a crowd of 10,000, inspiring their participation and rhythmic hand clapping. Brooks, a big man in a tuxedo and a blue black silk skull cap that Theolonius Monk would envy, makes his way deliberately through the maze of instruments and musicians to center stage. Under his arm, he carries a handsaw. Is he some beatific, satorially splendid carpenter making a house call? The crowd knows better. In anticipation, they shout their encouragement. Play the saw, Roy. Play the saw. Brooks adjusts the mic to waist height. The 4-4 groove continues, building toward repetition. Roy, Brooks, they chant, clapping in unison. Like a blues blacksmith with the saw handle locked between his knees, Blue Brooks begins whacking the business end of the implement with a mallet. The saw sings, when I saw my baby. Brooks getting tremolo by bending the instrument implement like a serrated backed steel snake with his left hand does a languorous lateral body movement from pelvis to knees. The notes are extended till they vibrate. I almost lost my mind. Then eases into, I'm so lonesome I could die. Play the saw, Roy, play the saw. Brooks ends his solo by gripping the handle firmly and shaking it with the ferocity of a shaggy dog emerging from a swim. The warbling steel crescendo explodes with the force and sound of a southern gale across a sharecropper's tin roof shack. Play the saw, Roy. The years in serious work, exploration, and mastery have not obscured his sense of the dramatic. A performance by this landmark innovator is big fun edutainment, oblivious to the applause and the many musicians staring at him for direction, Brooks strikes a pizza-sized gong with short, powerful strokes, then disappears into the wings, applause still ringing. Mbuje is his Swahili name. It means messenger. And other um, Detroit musician who um, was around at the time that uh, Pepper was, uh, was Beans Bowles. Uh, Beans was also a baritone player. And you, you probably have heard Beans even if you don't know it, in that he was on a lot of Stevie Wonder's. Uh, he was the band leader for Stevie Wonder. And there's some flute solos and some other uh, things behind Stevie on some of the Motown records that um, are Beans. And this piece is, um, it's about a baritone saxophonist being given praise by a younger baritone saxophonist, uh, James Carter. Written on the occasion of the memorial service for Dr. Charles Beans Bowles Sr. 5 February 2000 at S uh, Central University, I'm sorry, Central United Methodist Church. James Carter, with his tarnished baritone, began blowing Nature Boy. He chanted the melody and soloed for a couple of choruses, but soon, as became evident throughout the day, no one in this place, on this day, had to carry the burden alone. Don Mayberry on bass began with a toll-like single note throbbing. As Carter eased into his journey from the bottom of the horn, meditating and somewhere, some way we were into amazing grace. 
coming at that moment from two different directions. How sweet the song. Carter gathering himself, his wits and wisdom, a whisper growing through a growl to a honk, and we in the congregation smiled, nodded our heads, discreetly waved our hands, looked up, looked down, and he continued playing his horn, climbing in register and intensity and emotion, combining blues and gospel and mother wit, telling the church my mama done told me when I was in knee pants, and we talked back to him. You gonna wake beans up? Somebody warned. We covered our mouths, wiped our eyes, and Carter brought us back to the melody. There was a boy, a very strange enchanting boy. The, a man in the first pew put his arm around Harold, Beans's oldest son, laid his head on the man's shoulder and took his hand as Carter maneuvered back down to the horn's bottom again, deep down, like approaching thunder, rolling and tumbling across the high places and the low, the hills and the valleys or across the centuries like the thundering hoofbeats of fiery-eyed steeds swinging down the sweet chariot and stirring the night creatures, causing heads to rise, eyes to widen, ears to perk, notes from before language to echo in their throats, making owls hoot, canines howl, felines scratch at the door, and grown men turn on the light. As Carter, with circular breathing, sustained the swirling, whirling tension as Mayberry boomed, 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 like the breaking heart of each and all of us that bling, beans blessed with the clinging ablution of his music and his manner and his love. And we leaped to our feet, applauding the seeming nearing end of the tune. But young Carter, knowing in that way a healer age old or new ordained knows knew we weren't quite ready to be released or to release not with the weight of the burden we and beans had to bear and to bear so carter proving to us we could stand more than we fought a lesson learned a thousand times a day in this america but too easily forgotten Con carter continued to blow as he began to bow and straighten back and forth, calling, and we bowed and straightened, saying farewell, and he bowed and straightened, preaching, honking, trilling, testifying to and for us, putting us in even closer connection with ourselves and beans and all the music makers we have smiled with and nodded to and waved at and egged on in other communal moments and settings sacred and secular, and back and forth, Carter bowed and straightened, blowing. And then one day, he passed our way, back and forth, bowing and straightening. How sweet the tune that served, uh, saved a wretch like me, holding us, uniting us in the moment, in that moment of accord and correspondence and harmony, bowed and straightened, a human metronome, time made flesh, to and fro, and his horn moans and wails, Catalonian, Pentecostal, its sound and its intention breaking with the relentless timelessness of tides in their patient tenacity, breaking against us as if at a seawall of our resistance and subsides to gather and rush and wane to and fro, wave upon wave, amazing grace how sweet till the wall was worn away to a wash of sand and we were one and were ready one and all to be released one and all and to release one and all and in our unity acknowledge and grant and consent and concede and profess and allow that beans had been a privilege and a blessing and a reward and an opportunity and a bonus and a bounty and we one and all acknowledged as we in our unity had to acknowledge that it was time time to bow and straighten and witness that another good brother was going home
And the last piece, um, one of the musicians that Pepper played with um, was Charles Mingus. Mingus was a bassist, um, a very volatile individual, and uh, you can almost, you can, I imagine the contrast between Mingus and this kind of volcanic, per, volcanic personality that he had, and Pepper Adams with this very quiet uh, demeanor that he had, and uh, the kind of vibes and waves and, and uh, connection between the two of them. This is a, a, reco a recording that Pepper recorded more than once, and it's by Mingus, and it's called Better Get Hit in Your Soul. Charles Mingus, recorded September 20th, 1963. And get some gospel, some righteousness, some sanctified up in it, like after about four or five hours over in a Pentecostal service. Tongues, shouting, weeping, testifying, spirit hopping, popping like kernels in hot oil. So when you do finally get let out of, on dark afternoons, you'll be rapture wrapped. Have you some holy, some marching saints strut in your stroll. Make lowlifes and shakedowners anxious to get their raunchy butts on way from round you, back to where they first come from. You be so saved, make black cats turn tail. Make undertakers look the other way when they air and slow roll by where you at. Make Monday think it's Friday. Make fried chicken be good for you, cause nobody knows, nobody knows, and how you get over ain't they business, even if they do. Thank you very much. Bill Harris, thank you, Bill. My pleasure, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Trying to get, uh, Genevieve Caruso in the room here. She's having some trouble uh, zooming in and, and Facebooking, although I see Clark Iverson says, Bill Harris, <laughs> in his message. Um, thank you, Bill. Next, I want to, uh, I'm going to play a, a segment uh, that was uh, recorded in the studio with uh, Marion Hayden and Melba Joyce Boyd and uh, Tariq Gardner on drums. And uh, they're gonna do just a couple of, of pieces for us. So I'll uh, share the screen and we can, we can go to that. Let's see here. This next poem I wrote for Marion Hayden. And she and I will do a duet um, in presenting this piece. The base is woman. tilt adjacent to her throat, Marion mind bells with this magnificent instrument. Lift swift fingers, restraining eighth notes in cut time against bare knuckle restraints, releasing stress from neck past breast through a navel leading into a wound, gifting violet drifts like sweet rose water, brimming inside uninhibited thick hips that swing and sway, dancing on ripples of unreachable prayers. Her brown curves ground earth tones at the base of rhythm, the backbone of song.
This next poem is entitled Eulogy for Detroit, 1967. And there's a quote from Robert Kennedy, who unfortunately was assassinated in 1968. And his comment uh, during uh, this time in response to the riot was, uh, I'm sorry, the rebellion, is repression breeds retaliation. inside smoke clouds, police trap unarmed civilians in the Algiers motel, an allusion to Africa or a scene in Casablanca, a film with Sam, the black piano man, playing for Bogart, the hero fighting fascism. Cooper, Pollard, and Temple, three black teenagers caught crossing the color line, aspiring pimps partying with white chicks, Caught betwixt and between the skin game and police rage, emboldened by firepower and martial law. These three young men trapped in the annex of civil disobedience are like extras in a movie, already doomed by the script, or like fugitives detained at the border without citizenship, restrained, beaten, and murdered. Peregrine falcons once soared 
above skyscrapers, perched on gargoyles, guarding memories savored in museums, filled with tempered patrons searching passages to yesteryears. While we pray for the dead to wake living descendants of sons toiling in factory fields and Malawi daughters hidden in kitchens between bed linen, we are the evidence police terrorize. We are fissures in family portraits, cracks in their sacred democracy, the contradiction in their constitution, the inconvenience that clots their false rhetoric like toxic smoke choking the air. This poem, this poem is a eulogy, a remembering of 67, an unearthing of bloodstained graves, the opening caskets to treat wounds, enabling healing to retrieve breath currents of 43 lives rising and falling with the undertow of sanctuary seeking full measure of human remains. Our last poem is uh, We Want Our City Back. And this is a poem that I initially um, composed in the 1990s as we began to see the city um, facing all kinds of difficulties um, and problems. And uh, this poem has added and sort of grown as history continues to um, delineate these problems. So there are various actors who are identified uh, metaphorically. We want our city back. Thank you. 
want our city back. We want our country back from this rebirth of a racist nation. From a man who shakes hands with the Ku Klux Klan, who attacks peace protesting the police. Reversing religious freedom and deporting the people. God. Okay, Melba Joyce Boyd. Melba Joyce Boyd with uh, Marion Hayden on bass and uh, Tariq Gardner uh, on drums, which I believe is uh, Marion's son. But anyway, um, I want to thank Marion uh, for sending that in high res, and I hope it came through that way. It seems like it did. Um, I want to welcome to Detroit after after many attempts, <laughs> many tries uh, because of COVID, and um, he's here now, sort of. He's in Salt Lake City. He's on a mountain, uh, high on a mountain in uh, prayer and contemplation of Pepper Adams. Uh, Gary Carner is the archivist, biographer, and was a friend of Pepper Adams. And uh, he's done a lot of work. There's a great website he'll tell you about, uh, or you'll see it when I play a song from it. Um, he went to City College in New York City. That's where I met him. He did an album where he asked folks to write lyrics. Uh, and Barry Wallenstein, our mutual friend, was one of the people and I went to that show, I believe it was at Smalls uh, in New York City when the album debuted. So please welcome to the screen from Salt Lake City, Utah, Gary Carner. Thank you, ML. It's, it's really an honor to be here. I'm kind of humbled with all these wonderfully gifted poets. Can you hear me okay? Loud enough? Good. Yep, everything's okay, good. Great. Uh, I appreciated Bill Harris citing Al Young, the recently departed Al Young, because that quote actually is, is part of the 400 page biography that I just finished. Uh, him talking about the world stage. I wrote about world stage at length. I also interviewed Beans Bowles, and, and Bill Harris mentioned his manner and his love. I really was very touched by having an experience interviewing Bean Bowles, Beans Bowles at length, a really wonderful human being. So I was told to speak for 15, 20 minutes. It's, this is a pretty hard act to follow. Great program, really great. I figured what I would do is just grab a, a little vignette to give you a little context about Pepper Adams. This actually is the opening section of the biography which I've been working on for 37 years since the time that I knew Pepper Adams. I can just tell you that I met him in 1984. I interviewed him at length because I was going for a master's thesis at City College, and I'll mention that. And Pepper's lung cancer was diagnosed the following year. And so I, although I had a chance to know him, it was a pretty rocky time for both of us, certainly for Pepper as he was finding his life going through chemotherapy and he died. In, uh, in September of, of 1986, but I figured I would just, um, to read this little thing here, 
Um, it's a chapter called In Love with Night, which is a tune of Pepper's. And the epigraph of the chapter is We had a beautiful scene in Detroit, stated by Barry Harris, which sets off this entire section in which I talk about Pepper's time in Detroit from 1946 when he first got there, or returned, I should say, because he was born in Highland Park and then lived in upstate New York and went to school in upstate New York, came back to Detroit when he was 16 until he was drafted and went into Korea in the service. So here's the, uh, the opening section. Uh, on a chilly Detroit evening in mid-April 1949, 18-year-old Pepper Adams and two of his Wayne University friends made their way to the Mirror Ballroom to hear alto saxophonist Charlie Parker. Eager to see jazz's new leader, Especially with his working group, all three met at the theater, only a mile from campus. They purchased their tickets, walked upstairs to the balcony, folded their coats, and waited patiently for the show to begin. The mirror above the majestic school for dance is well known among Detroit's jazz community. I quote, I knew of its significance even then, unquote, said drummer Rudy Tusich, who used to ride past it every day on his way to high school. It was on the, first, on the second floor. You went in, door on the right side of the building, and walked the stairway up. It was a place of wonderment to me, along with the Grand Beach, Greystone, Jefferson, Vanity, and Monticello. The mirror was one of seven majestic dance palaces constructed during Detroit's early 20th century Art Deco architectural boom. In 1941, the venue moved from its historic building on the near west side to 2940 Woodward Avenue on Midtown Central Artery, two blocks from the palatial Masonic Temple. For quite some time that memorable night, there was considerable doubt whether Parker would show up. With their star attraction unaccounted for, the ballroom's management convinced trumpeter Dizzy Gillespie, scheduled to appear later that evening at the Paradise Theater only six blocks away, to front Parker's ensemble for the opening set. His surprise appearance, it was thought, would at least temporarily satisfy the audience while the Mirror staff anxiously awaited their headliner. Eventually, Parker arrived for the show, albeit more than an hour late. After placating the theater's distressed crew, he exchanged words with his group, assembled a saxophone, and readied himself for the next set. The room was dark except for the stage lights directed upon the bandstand. At long last, it was finally time for him to count off his first number. Parker began with one of his bristling up-tempo openers, and Adams was utterly spellbound. Quote, it was a night to remember, said Oliver Shear, who along with Pepper and Bob Cornfoot watched the electrifying spectacle unfold. Quote, Pepper was ignoring everybody in that room but Bert. I've never seen anyone so excited in my life. He said, can't you hear this man? He knew where he was going from that night on, I think. Adams had been playing his baritone sax for a little over a year, paying his way through college by working local gigs. He was still searching for his own sound and musical conception. But Parker's transcendent performance that evening gave Adams the paradigm he sought. He decided that his mission was to assimilate the many dazzling attributes of Parker's style adapting them as had never been done before to the baritone saxophone, not by copying Parker's licks and phrases as so many others would do, but by refining an approach that would be completely pers a completely personal style yet fully immersed in Parker's lexicon. As with Parker before him, his efforts would take a full decade to flower. It would necess necessitate thousands of hours of solitary practice and performing with others in a multiplicity of settings. Adams held Charlie Parker in the highest esteem. Quote, the greatest I ever heard was how he would assess Parker in 1984, 35 years after first seeing him at the mirror. By 1949, Parker's revolution in culture, as Ralph Ellison succinctly characterized it, was an entirely new way of playing jazz, a highly virtuosic style intended primarily for listeners. Sometime after his epiphany, Adams and Parker attended a Detroit jam session where each learned that both were passionate classical music aficionados. Quote, somehow the name Arthur Honegger came up. Remember at Adams about their first conversation. I said, oh, I love Arthur Honegger. And immediately I was Bird's friend because in Europe, Bird had heard quite a bit of his music, but he'd never before met an American who'd ever heard of Honegger. 
to attract Parker's attention as a teenager also says something about Adams's emerging confidence and musicianship. For the next few years, Parker would serve as a sage and confidant in time becoming a trusted colleague. Even with his encouragement, it took a leap of faith for Adams to think that one day he could become a virtuoso jazz soloist on an instrument that a Stanley Crouch once wrote, had the standoff qualities and resistant fury of a stallion that dares you to break them. In 1949, most baritone saxophonists still had trouble with the bulky instrument, particularly in keeping up with the beat. And to compli com complicate matters even further, with the advent of Parker's audacious new music, far more harmonic acumen and instrumental proficiency were expected from jazz solos. Undaunted and resolute, Pepper was convinced that not only was the baritone an instrument he could master, but that no style would be too demanding. Moreover, he was certain that the horn was the ideal vehicle to forge a unique identity as a stylist to make an enduring contribution to the art form. Quote, I saw it as a wide open field said Adams many years later when recounting his early days as a musician and assessing the Bighorn's appeal. Quote, no one was playing jazz in the way I felt jazz could be played on the baritone. I thought I had a chance to do something entirely different. And so he did. And so I think, ML, you wanna go and play that tune? We'll see what Pepper became. This is of course, Pepper at age 18. And now we're gonna to listen to a performance in 1982. That is what, uh, 30 years later, 35 years later or so at the Detroit Jazz Festival. Um, yeah, in, right uh, here September. in Detroit. Yeah, with Gary Shunk, who just passed away about a month ago too. Gary Shunk, the pianist. This will be Pepper introducing the tune playing the theme of the tune and then a solo and then it'll fade out. So it's about five minutes. Oh, <laughs> 
Pretty hard to follow that. Now to play an original piece. Um, do you want me to say a few words? Yeah, yeah, I do. Yes, I do, and um, there are some questions coming in from. Oh, great! The, from why, don't we, the, why don't we? Why don't we? do we dress those first? Okay. Uh, hopefully, my dog isn't too uh, too loud. Um, the one question uh, Bradley Stern asks: What or who? influenced his sound um was he also a disciple of leo parker good question actually no i think um his greatest influence was rex stewart from the duke ellington orchestra because he was very pepper was very inspired by rex stewart's sense of harmony uh wardell gray who had spent a lot of time in detroit the tenor saxophonist was a tremendous influence on pepper and Charlie Parker, and uh, son, the playing, particularly the baritone playing of Sonny Stitt, who carried three instruments for, for about three years when he was traveling in a group with Gene Ammons in the late 40s, early 50s, and also Wardell Gray when Pepper and he used to play on the bandstand and trade horns. Those were really the only influences that on baritone, those two were the only two that Pepper cited, although he did hear Leo Parker in Detroit. Leo Parker was in Detroit making some records in the late forties. But Pepper um, was uh, had a tremendous array of influences. Uh, he was very influenced by classical music too. And Thad, I can't leave out Thad Jones either. And Tommy Flanagan, the two great Detroiters, because they were his closest musical friends. Elvin Jones as well, but it's hard to say that a, a drummer is going to influence your melodic style, but Elvin was just ph phenomenal too. So hopefully that gives you a taste of that. Those yeah, influences. That, no, that's good. Um, a question that I, I had sure. as related to this. Um, so, and I'm going to show your page so people are familiar with it and they can see the oh, covers. Pepperadams.com. Yeah. Okay. And then they can see the new book and the and the first book, Joy uh, Road, the archives. Thank um, you. But the thing is, Gary, is um, and maybe you said this, and I was you know shushing the dog or something. But um, at the beginning, so you were from what I gathered, just knowing you, and and I should mention, Gary has a really nice uh, chapter on Pepper Adams in the Heaven Was Detroit book that I edited on Detroit music. That's when I met, well, I met him before that. And that's what made me think, got to get this guy to do something on Pepper Adams and get him in the jazz section of Heaven Was Detroit. Um, so, but you're, you were a jazz lover. And what did you do? You went, you saw Pepper Adams play and you thought this guy is it, or you just loved his music anyway as a legend or what? Well, you're asking me how this whole 37 year journey began. And I can right. tell you that I sent out five letters, you know, this is before Google, before email, this was 1984, uh, actually uh, 1983. 
I was between my first and second year at, at getting that master's program in English, studying with our friend Barry Wallstein. And uh, Pepper was the only person who replied. And he, he said that he had some time on his hands. He was actually nursing a pretty serious leg injury. No way. And he would love to meet me. So I went out there and we hit it off. Uh, I think partially because he liked to drink and I bought this fantastic bottle of sparkling French wine. That didn't hurt. But also because I think he was holed up in his house with this awful leg injury for five months, 22 hours a day with his leg elevated, miserable putting a complete break on his career. His marriage was collapsing. And he was just happy to, to talk and to, to and also with the, with the hope of somebody capturing his life. I wanted to do an oral history of, of a jazz musician. Um, but I think what cinched the deal is that I went to, to seventh grade with Thad Jones's son, Bruce. So it was like I was a family member. So we started interviewing, it was 18 hours that summer. Uh, got a lot of great information from him. But he was a rather um, close to the vest kind of guy. He spoke about his music. He loved talking about that and the records he made and the people he knew. The website includes several vignettes from these all the work that I've done. Him talking about Charles Mingus and um, uh, Duke Ellington and Charlie Parker and, and Thad Jones and the people that he that he wanted to discuss. But he was very close to the vest about his military experience, which is not unusual for people that that suffer trauma as a soldier. And he certainly did. And he didn't want to talk about his personal relationships. And I was interested in writing a full length biography and getting a sense of how this guy filled the room, what he was like, a flesh and blood character, rather than just a, um, a kind of thin book for jazz musicians and jazz fans. So I went on to interview over 250 people, musicians, people who knew him well, people off on the side of the stage, friends, poets, artists, all sorts of folks around the world, actually, and was able to put together, I guess you could say, a detective's composite of who he was. Oh, but yeah, he, uh, he was the only person who replied. It was kind of, it was faded. And uh, I didn't really know what I was getting into. I, I heard one great solo that I really liked on an Elvin Jones record and said, all right, this guy's for me. And uh, he's the one who got back to me. And here I am 37 years later, only just to finish because he's, he was such a rich character personally. He was absolutely beloved by his colleagues, very self-effacing, beautiful individual. And, and his music is spectacular. And the more I got exposed to it, the more I loved it. And so two books and a website and six CDs later, here I am. Yeah. <laughs> well, so when did he go to new york i mean and maybe bill knows this and and 56 um, really when they all went in that generation and uh if if i could say a few words i actually wanted to talk about that post-war generation because i don't think detroit's in my view has ever seen anything like it in the jazz field where there's been such a rich generation of extraordinary musicians and for many and I, and if bill wants to chime in that's great i didn't mean to 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 step no, on no, him, I just know Bill. Toes. Bill's a Detroiter, and he's. Oh, I know, around, so. I know, and he can certainly chime in. I, but for me, I kept asking, "What is it about these guys? What is it about these Detroit guys? What, what made them? What, what is it?" I would just for years um, try to figure it out, and I finally was able to piece it together. I think that that this remarkable generation of Detroit jazz musicians came to be because one. There's the influence of Grinnell's, the extraordinary piano manufacturer and retailer. Secondly, Detroit was a great industrial, still is a great industrial city, but it was able to uh, leverage its affluence to build this extraordinary, sup really superb public school music program that was begun by a wonderful woman by the name of Emma A. Thomas, who's Detroit's first supervisor of music. And she was a vocalist who taught at the Detroit Conservatory of Music. And she designed the first music teacher training program in the Midwest and conceptualized a visionary educational program that emphasized teaching Detroit's young children how to sing. And that curriculum lasted, they were exposed to it at a very early age and it lasted well into the 1960s. I interviewed Benny Maupin, 
from Detroit and he told me it was extraordinary. Everybody sang, everybody in all these schools was in glee clubs and uh, there was that. But also um, there was the longstanding custom of informal jazz education. It was just a well-established means of passing down the, the traditions vocabulary from Detroit's professional musicians to those on their way up. And so I write considerable length about this. I talk about all the great high schools that produce all these great musicians. Cass was one, obviously, I think you would know that. Um, well, there were several others. Uh, so, so, yeah. it, it, so what year was he born? 1930, okay. Highland Park. He didn't even know he was born in Highland Park until he had to get his birth certificate when he went into the service. And he couldn't find it when he went to the Detroit Records. He, in 1930, uh, we were in the dark, the great dark of the depression. His dad lost nine months of back pay. He was working at a very large furniture store downtown. They lost their house, they lost their savings. And so his parents split and Pepper was an only son, only child, I should say. And he and his mother went to Indiana near Fort Wayne, small village called Columbia City and lived there for four years. His father went to live with his family in upstate New York, and the family was finally reunified in 1934. So Pepper was educated and just barely in Indiana. He went to a one-room schoolhouse in kindergarten with kids aging from he was four, three and four then, from three and four up to about 13 or 14. Then went to Rochester and was educated in the Rochester school systems. And his mother, at, at it, when Pepper was 16, decided to move back to Detroit because she had a lot of friends that she missed. She was a school teacher and the pay was so much better in the Detroit school system than it was in Rochester. And that really- It's still phenomenal, to, I understand. No. I, I don't doubt it. <laughs> it's and not. quite- Pepper, Pepper cited that as, a, as the major change in his life. There was a series of major things, but moving to Detroit at that time, he'd already been playing professionally, whatever that means when you're 13 and 14 and 15 during the war when all the professional musicians are fighting in a way, but he got great experience in, in Rochester, but he immediately fell into this click, this great phenomenal click. Do you want me to just tell you what I've been able to discover about this click? Yeah, sure. Okay. So um, there was this, and I'll be brief because I know we're going over the hour. Um, there was a genuine brotherhood, a sense of it. And I'm actually quoting from this chapter of my book. There was a genuine brotherhood, a sense of being a part of something together that was culturally significant and much larger than themselves. Quote, every musician I know from Detroit has said this, remembered Eddie Locke, the drummer Eddie Locke in 1988. Quote, I saw Donald Byrd not too long ago, he said. I ne Donald Byrd said, I never got the same feeling that I got in Detroit. There was something else going on there. What Byrd and Locke were referring to is Detroit's non-judgmental approach to teaching the art form and the profound connection that bound all of them together because of it. Quote, the friendship shared by Detroit's jazz musicians gave you the feeling that you could go ahead and play, said Locke. There were so many little funky joints that had music in it. When you're in those joints, you could go ahead and do your thing. Although young musicians knew better than getting on the bandstand until they had acquired a certain level of technical mastery, playing alongside Detroit's older musicians was a liberating experience, coupled with the down-home informality that was found in the city's many cozy neighborhood venues, it allowed aspiring jazz musicians to take risks in front of an audience. It gave them a chance to develop their identity as soloists without the fear of embarrassing themselves and dealing with the suffocating machismo that was customarily me meted out by aggressive musicians in other cities. Thus the hallmark, as I see it, the hallmark of Detroit's jazz apprenticeship model was its extremely nurturing way of passing down the tradition. Its jazz musicians became so accomplished in part due to its remarkable and truly anomalous female-centered educational culture that contrasts so dramatically with the prevailing male-dominated cutthroat ethos historically a part of America's jazz culture since its infancy. Wow. That for me was, was uh, extraordinary to discover. I mean, I have more, but I think that's essentially it that I wanted what? to share with your audience. 
so the book is the book is coming out in September. Is that correct? Correct. correct. Uh, this is the book I promised Pepper on his deathbed. Oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna put this up right now so people can see the the two books that you uh that I, again I just so much wanted to figure out what made Detroit musicians and these these great artists different. And I think that's really it, or those three things are really it. And so this is the Joy Road book, which is available in both electronic and um, and hard copy. And yeah. Reflectory is what's coming out in September. Correct. And so, you know, at some point when that comes out, you're going to have to, you know, either come here or, you know, do some kind of signing uh, because people here are interested in that and oh, they'll, they'll want to see that. And Thank once again... Much. This is the uh, website, the pepperadams.com that Gary has put together. And it's uh, absolutely an incredibly informational. Plus it has a lot of links to uh, rare performances by Pepper uh, in it. So um, I don't think there's any other questions unless anybody in the Zoom room wants to ask one. Uh, if not, I definitely want to thank um, uh, Bill Harris for joining us tonight. Uh, thank Mary and Hayden and uh, Melba Joyce Boyd and Tariq Gardner for joining us virtually uh, uh, in, a, in a nice sounding studio. And of course, uh, get, uh, Gary Carner for coming and um, finally making, you know, he was going to come in person in what, early 2020 and then this whole thing went down the tubes but um, I'm anxious to see this book and read it and know more uh, I've learned a lot about it through you and through Barry and that one record you did you want to mention that record is that, I don't know if that's on your website um, to show but tell them about this interesting record project you did with Pepper's Music oh the the, the six volume CD set yeah, yeah. um where you had uh, sure. people like Barry write the lyrics and yeah, Barry. Yeah. What happened is I was sitting at the village Vanguard one night and I had this inkling to maybe produce a record of, of Pepper's recordings, but being the uh, completest I've become, I decided to take some of my life savings and do recordings of, of all of his music. He wrote 42 magnificent tunes. But he, so I did that, and then if that wasn't enough, I decided, well, he really wanted lyrics written to his ballads. That was one of his, his dying wishes. So I went to Barry Wallenstein and asked him to do this project. He had never done lyrics before and really got inspired by it. And we got a tremendous band in Chicago to record the music with the vocalist Alexis Cole. And so those were, that's the, the five volumes. Those were released on Motema Records. That's available, Motema Music. And then I decided I wasn't satisfied with that. So I wanted to get some big band charts done. So I have a, a friend who had a friend in England who wrote these spectacular big band charts. So there's six CDs available and that's, you can, you can read about that and hear some of the music on pepperadams.com. It was a, a fantastic project, really exciting. Well, I was really impressed that night that I went to see the debut of the Barry, the Barry album, we'll call it like sure. the white album the berry album um <laughs> so uh and that singer was incredible and wasn't she like a marine or something at that time she was in the military yeah she's since resigned um good good so, yeah she, she's going on to do a lot of great things she's she was really singer. good really yeah. good and the band was incredible well thank you again gary uh i'm sure. sure we'll be seeing you as this book hits the uh the public Again, thanks to Bill Harris, Marion Hayden, Melba Joyce Boyd, and Tariq Gardner. Um, and uh, for more information on Pepper Adams, look up pepperadams.com. So Gary, you're out in the West, so it's only 5.15 to you. So thank you for joining us. And thanks everybody for tuning in via Facebook and, uh, and on the Zoom link. So, okay, thanks everyone. See you, Gary.